Um, today, uh, we, we will discuss uh, three things. So the first thing is um, we have started doing a little bit of a um, review of different programming languages. Um, so if I go, uh, can I find this one? So uh, we have the students folder. And in the students folder, we have a number of Im implementations of this simple uh, command line processor where you can enter a command and then the processor instantiates a student and then puts it into kind of a memory database. And then you can list all the students. And the idea was to write a simple processor such that it handles, it simulates uh, handling um, errors, which you typically have in a REST application where a user's user fills in a form and then the validation happens and you have to tell the user what's wrong with the, with the fields of the form, right? So the, we, we discussed that there are uh, multiple ways of dealing with the errors. And one way is that um, we internally catch the error and we kind of ignore it. Uh, but in this particular case, when the user entered something in the form and you are processing it and you see those validation errors, you have to tell the user everything that is wrong such that the user can fix it. So, not, so out of the three different ways of dealing with it, um, the first one that we deal with it internally, the second one then we report the first error which, which we caught uh, or that we report all the errors, we kind of implementing all the errors, right? So uh, we have um, uh, a simple generator which generates the, the data for, um, for this particular case. So if I go, yeah, let's go to this one, for example. So if I go, um, that's one for the small fonts. All right, so we have um, generator uh, and the generator um, generates as much data as you want and it generates either wrong or correct, correct data. So what you can do is you can uh, say cargo build uh, release. So in, in Rust, uh, the default commands, when you build something in Rust, it builds in a debug mode. Um, and in the debug mode, the application will be probably about six to 10 times slower than if you build it in release mode, okay? So if you want to use it, if you want to, to, to actually um, uh, use a particular implementation, it's better to build it with release because it will be substantially faster. Um, and then what you can do is you can say, um, oops, target. And then you have, um, so Rust then generates uh, a folder called target, and then you have a debug and release subfolders. And then in the release or debug subfolders, you will have the executable. So in our case, it is called student gen Rust, um, and it generates the data for you. So what we can do is we can say, um, yeah, so first we can say help. So it will show you what the um, command line parameters are. So it's, uh, it takes uh, C and I for correct and incorrect uh, outputs. So what you can do is you can say, I want correct five, and incorrect five. Um, and I want the output to go to output 10.txt. And then it will generate the file. And if we, if we print it, we'll have kind of a data file like this. So it generates this kind of a new student commands. And then we can use them for feeding into the, uh, the application, right? So now if I go level up and I go to the uh, Rust implementation, um, I can build, so I can say again, car cargo build release, and I can say target um, release, and it's called student Rust. And then normally if I, if I run it, I can say list, so it lists all the students that we have. If I do some rubbish, it says unknown command. And then if I say new and type something, it will print me the errors that, that we have. 
And then if I add a correct student, it will print things correctly. And if I do end, it ends. So now I, I can do the same, but with my test data, right? So I can feed it with the, um, with the test data, which I have level up in the folder uh, generator Rust output. Output 10 txt. All right, so now I'm feeding the, the 10 students in. Uh, and what happens is um, for the wrong ones, it prints the wrong ones. And then for the good ones, it prints nothing. And then at the end of this file, we say list and it lists all the students which, are, which it has in the database, right? So it basically prints the number of wrong attempts and then it prints all the good ones at the end and then it quits right so when i'm feeding it with the data that's what 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 exactly what happens uh, for testing the the programs i don't really need to to print it right so for example i have um, a five million um five million students two and a half million wrong and two and a half million correct and then if i do that it's gonna take uh, ages for the, the stupid thing to print it, right? So I, I don't really want to, kill, kill, kill. I don't want to really observe the screen and, and, and see that it's printing all of that. And even then I don't know if it's did it correctly, right? So what I do is um, I will not use 5 million because it still takes some time. So I still use the 10, uh, but I pipe it um, with word count. Right, so what word count does, it counts all the uh, input which goes into the word count, and then it gives me three, um, three numbers. Um, the first number is the number of lines, then we have the number of words, and then we have the number of characters, right? So we see that it prints 11 instead of 10, right? Uh, because the Rust implementation prints one extra and like empty line at the end of printout, right? So if I do this with 10, you will notice that uh, it has this one extra empty line here, right? Uh, so it will print five incorrect ones, five correct ones, and this empty line. Uh, it, it is kind of a bug, oops, sorry. Um, so we should fix it. So it should really print only 10, right? Uh, and it's the same with the with all the other implementations. So then, if you on your computer, if you generate yeah, you know five million students and you feed it into the uh, the different implementations, so I can uh, go to to go and go build, do exactly the same. In Go, we don't have any uh, release or debug options. And then if, if I feed those ten. Uh, Output 10 txt. Gen, oops, generate Rust. Yeah, so it will do the same. As you see, it doesn't have this empty line here. So then if I count it, um, oops. So then I count the output and I can val validate, okay, it's correct, right? It, it has um, 10. So now just for the sake of doing this, I can do the same with the 5 million uh, students. And then you will see some data, right? So to, I mean, it will do this and then I will see um, the printout, but I will not know how long it took. So there is a command which is called time. And again, it kind of counts how long the command which is after the time took, right? So, um, yeah, I, I'm not gonna use 5 million. 5 million takes about 15 seconds on my box. So I, I'm gonna do 10, but you will get the idea, right? So here I see that the program correctly counted everything. And here I see how long it took, right? So in total, it took 10 milliseconds. And then I can see uh, some additional statistics on, on how long the particular program took. So on your, on your platform on Linux, there is time as well. And uh, on Windows, I don't know, but you should be able to measure how long something takes. And then what you can do is you can basically build those, um, uh, those implementations that we have and measure. Um, so we have those, those implementations here. Uh, it's kind of a bad font. Um, 
So we have C++, uh, we have Go, Haskell, JavaScript, Python, and Rust so far. If you can think of another language that you like, uh, you can implement the processor and we can kind of compare it, how it is implemented and how it works. Um, I had a couple of uh, comments already from this exercise. So one comment is, um, which of those existing implementations do you think is the slowest? So we've implemented all those, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ones. And which one was the slowest? What do you think? What is your intuition? So uh, Sindra is saying JavaScript. Uh, what, Haskell, yeah? Well, so we have uh, two, um, two suggestions. So for the uh, for the slowest, we have JavaScript or we have Pascal. Uh, I thought it would be Python, to be honest. So, and for the fastest, what do you think is the fastest? Okay, what what's after C? What's the fastest after C? I also thought C would be the fastest. Worse. All right, so we have C plus plus or Rust. Um, so I thought I thought C plus uh, plus, and then I thought uh, Rust and Go will be kind of similar, right? Um, so th those are the intuitions, and the, the exercise here is that almost always our intuitions are wrong. Okay, uh, so um, the funny thing is the slowest one out of all the ones that I've tested was C++, right? And it was not just a little bit slower, it was like massively slower, okay? Um, but it wasn't the problem with C++, it was a little bit the problem of how it was implemented, right? So initially the implementation was uh, accumulating the errors and vectors and returning those vectors from those validation functions and then adding the vectors together. And it was using sh share pointers. Um, and then Carl rewrote it, and I, I also rewrote it a little bit, such that we don't return the vectors, we kind of pass the vector in, add the new errors to the same vector, uh, and we remove the usage of the share pointers. So that improved the performance like 10 times, right? Uh, so just the way you've implemented something has a huge impact on how, how it performs, right? Uh, and I was really surprised with that. The other thing which I was really surprised was I ran the Python version. So, so okay, so the baseline was about 15 seconds for Go, right? Um, the Python version was about um, 55 seconds. So it was massively slower, right? But if you run it with Python 3, it was 20 seconds. It was like massively faster. It was actually faster than C++, right? <laughs> so, um, if you go to, um, yeah, so let me, yeah, let me do this now such that I can show you the, um, so let's go to Haskell. Yeah, 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 yeah. Students Haskell. So the, th this data is on my machine. And of course, I'm using a particular compilers with particular flags, such that the data might be slightly different to, uh, to you. Uh, but if we, uh, if we check it out, so, So um, this is the, okay, let's make it bigger. This is the current data that I have from, the, from running the tests on 5 million students. So C is by far the fastest and it's like massively faster than anything else. Um, there are two reasons for that. One reason is that it is generally faster because we 
don't muck around with uh, function pointers too much and, and so on. So it's um, usually much more lean implementation. And also uh, uh, Carl did slightly different algorithm to accumulating the errors. So instead of accumulating errors in a form of some sort of a string that, uh, array or string vector, uh, he just accumulates the errors by a bits in a single by in a single number. And then by knowing which bit is uh, turned on, we know which error happened, right? So like there is nothing to like much to store. It's just one int that, that you need to store. And then you have like a, a static lookup to which all the bits mean, right? So it's a, a really clever way of uh, accumulating errors. And it's like massively faster than anything else, right? So if we rewrote the validation in a similar spirit to the way that we've done it, like in other languages, it would be probably much slower, right? So the reason why C is so massively much faster is not just because C is faster, it's just the algorithm is different, right? If, if you did the same algorithm with those other ones, you would see the, the difference as well. So um, C++ is here, is actually slower than the Python 3, right? Uh, I was really surprised with that. Um, and um, I haven't debugged the um, and benchmarked the performance, but I suspect it's because um, Python is using those uh, C implementations for some of the functions that we're using. And then it's like basically optimized, um, you know, hand, hand optimized. There is a big difference between Python 3 and Python 2, right? So Python 2 was indeed uh, quite slow, uh, but Python 3 uh, is really, really fast. Um, there is a huge difference between Rust release and Rust debug, right? That's what I said, like don't, never use Rust debug unless you're really debugging. Uh, when you're actually doing stuff, try to do that. And this is what uh, I said with the C++ with shared pointers and, and vectors. Um, it was like, it was the, the slowest out of everything that we've tried, right? Uh, it was kind of nice. I, I don't think it was like massively ugly, like in terms of uh, style, but it was like really inefficient. Um, and then the other surprise is the JavaScript. <laughs> Kind of kicks ass, right? Uh, so why JavaScript kicks ass so so nicely? It like beats uh, Rust, you know, by a big margin, right? Um, it's a bit funny. Uh, so Node is um, Node has asynchronous I/O, right? So this particular application is a little bit stupid because most of the time you you waiting for stuff to be printed to the output right so you're waiting for stuff to come in through the input and for stuff to go through the output the actual processing comparatively is really fast and that's why when you're piping it through wc where you don't actually print to the terminal it, it just in memory pipe to the word count it's much faster than if you're just printing it to the screen for example right it still needs to print it it still needs to kind of output everything in, but it's outputting it like in, uh, through memory and it, you know, it's massively faster. So Node.js has a huge advantage here because uh, it has uh, unblocking IO. So every time we say read something or print something, we can do processing while we're waiting for the IO to complete, right? Because the IO is asynchronous. So what happens is we're processing the first student uh, and we say, oh yeah, we have some errors and we have to start printing the errors, but while we start printing the errors, the CPU starts doing the next student, right? We don't block at that point. So those two things kind of happen at the same time. And because of this um, unblocking IO, it, it has the edge because this is a very IO heavy you know, use case. And then it, it basically benefits from it. The interesting thing is that uh, if you, yeah, I, let, let me show you the, uh, the JavaScript version. So if I go to JavaScript and I say note uh, students and we pipe it with the generator output 5 million students. So let's don't print it. So we count it and then we measure it. You will see that it's a little bit uh, tricky. So it's basically uh, feeding the 5 million students into the student JS, and then it's, it's generating it, it's doing it. Um, and then, yeah, it takes about 11 seconds, I guess. 
So let's hold our breath for a moment. What was there? So, yeah, let me see. Those students, because. Uh, yeah, so I have, I have a, a hack here, uh, and the hack is that um, because the program kind of registers a listeners a listener for the standard input, and it kind of uh, um, processes the standard input, but it doesn't um, kind of uh, quit on itself. So then you have to kind of kill it at some point. Um, but depending on like, yeah, so let's, let's do that again. So if I do that now, uh, because here, here you see that it did the, the entire, entire batch, but it, it is much slower than it normally needs to do that. Um, so it, of course, it also depends what you're running on the computer. If I have the uh, zoom uh, streaming and so on, right? So if I, if I have zoom, all those all those uh, results will be uh, slightly off. So here uh, we only use 16 seconds, and you see that it kind of uh, finished processing the uh, the students, but it didn't finish to print them all out. We only printed like 300,000, right? Uh, so that's why I had to like when I was doing the test, I had to kind of balance it when I can quit the program such that it already printed everything, such that I can measure uh, when, it, when it happened because it is um, asynchronous. Um, yeah, anyway, you can have a little bit of fun with it. You can check it, check it out. Uh, one question here is when you're doing multiple runs and you have, of course, it, it will take a different uh, time for each run. Uh, should you average it or should you take, what, what should you take? Or should you take the slower, the, the fastest one? What do you think it makes sense? Yeah, so it kind of depends a little bit what you want to really compare. But um, for this particular comparison, I think taking the fastest that you get out of the batch is the most reasonable because that sim uh, basically demonstrates what, what is possible with this particular implementation, right? Uh, if you take the average, what, what happens is you have some outliers, like some slow outliers, and then the average will be kind of converging slowly to this fastest time, right? Um, however, some, some of the implementations might be uh, using like a garbage collector on, or they will be kind of sensitive to some memory fragmentation and so on. So then they will kind of depend a little bit of what, what is on the system, right? So for the practical use case, you may need to uh, to take an average sometimes, right? In, in this particular case, for this data that I have here, I ran it three times and I took the fastest time that I could get out of the three runs, right? Um, so uh, Haskell is, uh, is slow, but it's not like massively slower than uh, the, you know, the, this category. We, we, we can definitely make C++ faster, right? Uh, so I would think uh, if we think about it and if we measure what makes the C++ slower in this particular case, we can probably reach the levels of, um, of Rust and, and, and uh, Go, right? It shouldn't be much slower or, or should be probably faster than those. Um, I don't think anyone can reach this level unless you really re-implement the way the errors are being accumulated, right? So. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a one fun fun thing uh, that uh, you can check. So you can use the generator and you can use the uh, your own system to check what data you have, and then you can add uh, you can add a section in this uh, Haskell readme file uh, and add your own data such that we can compare. For example, what uh, I I will put my uh, my data like uh, what was that result on on it was on this laptop, so I can say uh, what did I use. Yeah, th there is one more comment. Um, with Rust and with Go uh, and with Node and with Python, um, you just compile it and you run it. 
uh, you don't muck around with the compiler optimization flags or anything. With C and with C++, it depends like what compiler optimization flags you use. And sometimes it depends whether I've used the Clang compiler or whether I use GCC. Uh, one, sometimes GCC was faster, sometimes Clang was faster, not by huge margins, but like noticeably. Uh, so you need to play around, right? So for example, to implement it in Python, it took me like 20 minutes and I was done. Uh, to test in C++ and, and C, it took me 20 minutes just to test it because I had to play with all those different flag combinations and compiler combinations, right? Uh, so I was quite inefficient, like just testing it. Uh, with Go and with Rust, yeah, you, with Rust, you just, uh, you know, build with release and, and you're kind of done. With Go, you just build and you're done. Uh, you don't do anything. Uh, you can, in Go, you can remove all the debugging symbols from the executable and it will make the executable smaller. Uh, and you kind of do it like, uh, like this. Um, and then for some of the fastest um, um, compiler flags, I put them here. What, what did I use? Uh, usually the O fast was the fastest. Um, with Haskell, you can also put the optimization flags into the compiler, but they were not making a huge difference. So maybe like if I don't do anything, it is like 29.5. And then if you do some, some things, it's, it drops a little bit. Um, it would be nice to have some other uh, popular languages here, uh, such that we can compare a little bit of, a, of the style, uh, but um, yeah. So anyway, so that's, um, that's that part. So then um, the, the, there are two things left. Uh, one is the assignment and one is Rust uh, pattern matching. So let's do pattern matching first. Um, this is quite nice and it, it is, um, not many languages have such a powerful pattern matching um, uh, capabilities as Rust has, um, but you already are familiar with that because we had it in, in Pascal. So uh, for you, it should not be uh, much, of a, much of a difference. So let me just go. All right, so, um, when we talk about pattern matching, uh, we have to start by um, kind of reviewing what do we mean by pattern matching and what have you used pattern matching in other languages, right? So let's take C++, for example. Um, what could you consider matching or, um, it's not necessarily a pattern matching, but like matching in, in C or C++. Yeah, perfect. So, and before switch, what is switch useful for? Like to substitute what? Ifs, yeah, exactly. So normally we have the if statement, like most languages have if statement. And then the if statement is a form of checking if something is of a particular type or a particular value, right? So usually we have some sort of variable and we check if it's three, right? Um, so this is a, a very primitive form of uh, pattern matching uh, because we can match uh, uh, a variable uh, with some sort of constant or with some sort of value, right? And then we, we have kind of a then and else blocks. Uh, and if we have kind of a complex nesting, um, then uh, yeah, it, it was, I, I didn't program in Python for a while, so. <laughs> So, you know, uh, in, in Python, you have this elif thing. Uh, it, like I, I thought you have else, but you don't. <laughs> I mean, you do have else if you don't have the other if, but if you have else, if you cannot say else if, you have to say elif, right? So again, it's like, you, you wonder like why they make it inconsistent, right? It would have been consistent if you could just say else if, right? Uh, but you have to say elif. Um, yeah, anyway, um, you have those kind of sections and then if they are nested, then we have a switch, right? So a switch uh, is uh, a, a kind of a construct where we put the variable kind of at the top, and then we have some sort of a way of matching the, the variable uh, to particular values. And in, um, in C, C++, you can kind of put, you, you are limited to what you can put here, 
and then you are kind of a little bit limited of what the case statements are, right? Because you like if x is an integer, yes, you can say you know three, um, and then you, usually you have uh, kind of a default. Um, if like you you do the you do the pat patterns, so let's say we have something like this. Uh, and then you have a default fallover if none of the patterns matched, right? And then again, you have some behaviors. Um, for example, in um, in C C plus plus, you have kind of a fall through behavior, uh, such that if this matches, then it it will still execute the next branch even if the upper one matches, right? And then you have to say break to break this fall through behavior, right? Uh, in Golang, they decided, yeah, this fall through is a bit dangerous because sometimes you didn't notice that it's kind of fall through. So you have a keyword, which is fall through. Uh, and then fall through like forces the, the fall through the, the, the chain. And the default behavior is that after the pattern is matched, you quit, right? Um, so in Rust, um, they kind of, uh, or oh, in Haskell, uh, we, we have kind of similar, uh, similar construct where we can match um, some, some variable into values, but we can do that based on the value or a value range or a type, right? So you have kind of a much more powerful uh, capabilities of what and how this matching happens. So another um, matching format that you sometimes have is, um, for example, you can say I have uh, a tuple X and Y, and I have some variable V, right? So my, my V is a tuple, and then by assigning the right-hand side to the left-hand side, I'm destructuring the, the complex type, which is V in this case, into the, the tuple, right? And then if, um, if V is a tuple and, uh, or, uh, so so let's say v is uh, one uh, text, then uh, x will be one and y will be text, right? Um, so this is again a form of pattern matching uh, where we do destructuring. Um, and this destructuring is quite useful. Uh, so for example, I can have a student, I can have s, and let's say I have my student with name Marius and age. Uh, 10, right? So then uh, by doing the destructuring, what I can do is I can say, uh, let's make it cups. So I can say I have a student and then I have a kind of name and age, um, yeah curly braces or round braces, depending which language we're talking here about. And then you say S and then it will check if S is of type student. And if it is, it will substitute name with the actual value of name and age with the actual uh, age, right? Uh, and it is kind of useful for um, getting insight of a particular struct or particular type uh, variable, uh, variable of a particular type such that we can extract uh, some of the content and, and, and use it because then I can say, you know, uh, H, um, I can do something with a number, right? Uh, because I, I kind of got it. I don't have to say S dot H, right? So in some languages, it kind of doesn't matter so much because you have this dot notation and you're getting into inside fields easily. In Haskell, you kind of uh, need to do this functional um, extraction of, of values such that I would have to say, uh, if this is a record type, then I would have to say HS to get the H and that's cumbersome. So sometimes this structuring is kind of more, uh, more beneficial. So long story short in Rust, in this kind of a, a switch statement, which in Rust is called match, um, we can do not only matching on the values, but we can actually do the destructuring as well, right? So if X is a complex type, we can kind of uh, match uh, on the, uh, like we can say student and then, um, and then destructure the, the, the insights of the student and either 
Um, so with the structuring, you again have two options. So you can either um, say, uh, let's say I, I do this. So I have um, V, which is my tuple, um, right? So let's delete that, right? So, so V is my tuple and I can, I can do this um, work. Um, yeah. So, um, and X and Y are now variables which get bound to what the uh, V has. And then this pattern, this matching, this, this structuring cannot fail, right? Unless uh, V is not of a tuple type, but then the compiler should tell me like, oh, you, you cannot do this at all because like, you know, if V is a number, if V for example is um, 10 instead, then this cannot happen because I, I have mismatched types, right? So in strongly typed languages, I would not be able to compile it. In languages that are not uh, uh, typed or and, and force type, then this would happen, but then this would fail, right? But let's constrain ourselves to languages that have a uh, uh, type system. Uh, and in the, in the typed languages, if I have V being 10, this cannot compile. So I can only compile that. And then this will always match because V will have some sort of default values, even if it's uninitialized, right? Um, so, but if I substitute it with, uh, let's say I do, I do this with two, right? Uh, then that would not match for V because V has one in that spot, right? So I can either bound by the structuring, I can either bound something to a variable or I can try to match and see if they kind of match and bound only the things that are, that are variable, right? Um, so in this particular case, this particular destructuring would fail because V doesn't have two in the first slot. It has one in the first slot, right? Uh, so you could potentially have patterns which uh, failing. And in this particular case, that would fail. And because it would fail, most languages don't, don't allow you to have patterns that potentially can fail because then you don't know what to do with this assignment. Like, do you call it off? What happens with Y, right? If, the, if that failed. Um, so in Rust, you can do both. Uh, you have this match statement, which you can do um, value matching and uh, matching of the uh, destructuring either that can fail or that can succeed. So let's, uh, let, let's change it again to V. It will be simpler. So I can say I have, um, um, yeah, so I have this case with Y. And then if that's the case, then the first, uh, like this pattern uh, will fail, fail for V, right? Because V is not two. Uh, if I do this pattern, um, so if I say X, and Y, that pattern will always succeed, right? Uh, because the, the X and Y will get bound to what uh, whatever the V slots are, right? So that one will fail, but that one will succeed. I can fill up that, that one as well. So I can say, uh, if it's two and Marius do something, but if it's, uh, uh, you know, Tom uh, do something else, right? Uh, it's kind of the same as in, 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 in Haskell, um, but, this, this one, this assignment thing, uh, if, if it is unfailing, that's not problematic, but if it's failing, it's a bit problematic. So in Rust, uh, they decided, yeah, it, it's sometimes useful to have those uh, potentially failing uh, pattern matching, which is partial, like match has to be, uh, uh, match has to be done completely, right? If we, if we um, doing a match, and we don't exhaustively, like if we stop here, the compiler will complain that V can have a value which will not match this pattern. It will not match this pattern and then we don't know what happens, right? So it's kind of a partial matching which is which has a bit of undefined behavior. So the compiler will complain, with, with, it will insist that you have to finish it with uh, all the variants for the V that will, at least one of them will match, right? So you, usually you just uh, use this kind of a default fall through 
uh, for the uh, for V such that you catch all possible uh, patterns. With this one, uh, sometimes we want to have a partial matching, uh, and we don't care if it is not fully matching because, for example, we're checking just for the error, right? So if we, um, yeah, let's let's hold this one for a moment, uh, the V V for a moment, and have uh, error which is. Uh, result of, of type result, right? So we have a result and then we have to, we got this, like we, we had some call um, to our function and then we need to check if error is of error or if we had success, right? So we don't want to check exhaustively with match and do something with the success. We just want to handle the potential error. So then we, we, are, we have a situation where we don't want to do the exhaustive pattern matching on error. We just want to check this uh, one particular pattern. Um, so to, to do that, um, you have the if let uh, statement in Rust. So if let allows you to specify the pattern and variable, and then do something like uh, do some behavior if that is successful. So if the if if this assignment is successful or this this structuring or this uh, check is successful, then this block will happen. Otherwise, it, you know, else will happen or nothing will happen if you don't have else uh, section, right? So in this particular case, we we would say okay, if we have success, um, and we kind of don't care what the value is, and if we have error on that right hand side, and if that pattern matches then we, we kind of execute the, the behavior. If not, we don't, right? So we can have potentially uh, a failing assignment. So the same with the same here, we can say uh, with V, we say, okay, if our tuple is two and some text or T, uh, if that is correct, then here we have the access to T, we have T bound to a particular value, uh, but we know that the first part of the V is two, right? Uh, if if the first uh, first element of v is one, like here, then this will not match, and that will be false. So then, if we have else close, the else close will be executed. If we don't have anything, nothing will happen. Um, so the, you know, here you control what patterns do you match and which ones you skip. Here, the compiler enforces you to match all the possible patterns. Um, so there is one extra thing that uh, you may not care. So for example, you may not care about what is the first value of the V, uh, but you want to match anything is like a wild card. So then you have um, two options. You either use underscore and then you don't care and you don't have a, a bound uh, variable to it, or you can say um, underscore X and then it, it, it also signals to the compiler that you don't care about the, the value, right? Um, so you can either use just underscore or underscore or, or a variable which has the first character and underscore. Um, in some languages, like in Haskell, you don't have the second option. In Rust, you do. Um, I guess they, they chose it because you may want to have some meaningful name for it or something that you say, I don't care about it, but it holds this, right? I don't know. Uh, in Golang and in um, in Haskell, you use underscore for things that you don't care. Um, there is also um, a, um, a, like if we have, let's say, if we have two, um, like if the let's say I have two tuples, I have V1 and V2, and I have uh, V2, which says two, two, all right, so, okay, so then um, you could match on V1, um, and, but you can also on the fly generate a tuple or generate a new, new um, variable, that you will use for matching inside. So for example, if I uh, generate uh, on the fly a new tuple here, and I say my new tuple is um, v1 comma v2, 
Then in my patterns, I now have two, um, like I have the outer tuple. Um, so I have the outer tuple and then I have the comma and then I have the two inner tuples, right? So I have uh, tuple two. So for example, if I do this, then what I'm matching is I want in V1, I want the first value to be two and the second to be Marius. And then I don't care what the second one is at all. It's just a variable, right? Which will get bound to whatever V2 is uh, such that uh, for our particular case, uh, that, will, that will fail. But if I do the, the reverse, if I say V1, V2, that will succeed, right? So this pattern will succeed and I will do the behavior that I have um, that I have here. Because uh, V2 is indeed uh, to Marius and then uh, T2 will be bound to this. And then I can do something here with uh, whatever I want and uh, with, uh, T, with T2. Does it make sense? So uh, it, it is a very powerful mechanism. It's just get, getting used to it. Like uh, if you did uh, the pattern matching in Haskell and you got the idea of matching the types and not using if statements, uh, then it's very powerful. And the match, match statement is also very, very powerful. And it enforces uh, certain constraints on the, um, it really enforces the good behavior, right? Because it will, complain if you don't check all the patterns. It, it's the same in Haskell with the function definitions. If you specify a function and you don't deal with the empty list case uh, and you take a list as an argument and you have some patterns, but you don't have an empty list, the compiler will give you a warning. It will allow you to compile the, the code, but it will give you a warning saying uh, non-exhaustive patterns, right? It's the same here. It will complain that the patterns are not, not exhaustive. And uh, where where it is useful uh, for um, for testing. Um, so let me let me delete this. So um, there, are, like you know, if you have just a simple value types, that's not that uh, that powerful. Uh, when where it shines is um, so for example, it it shines with tuples. So tuples are really good for um, the structuring and for kind of uh, matching the particular constraints. So instead of saying, if this is this, or if something like, you know, if very quickly becomes ugly uh, with structs, um, that's also uh, very useful to, uh, to combine the pattern matching with, with structs. And then with enums in, um, uh, in, in Rust language, right? So, if you have enums and for example, if you have result or if you have some sort of a error type. Uh, so if, like, you know, if you say I have my error and then the, uh, my error is, a, is an enum and this enum has, you know, I, I have an IO error and I have, um, I don't know, uh, you have a number of different errors that could happen, right? Uh, then, uh, when you get an error and you need to kind of dispatch or do something with it, then if you use a match, uh, then the compiler will force you to dispatch on all the possible errors that this could have, right? Uh, so you cannot forget, uh, like for example, in, um, in Java where you are catching an exception and you say, I'm handling IO exception, but you may have some other exceptions that could have happened in that, in that section, right? Uh, then you have to use a wildcard saying, okay, I'm catching, you know, all other exceptions, like by, by saying exception. Um, so it's similar here. You can kind of have a kind of a default handler, which says, okay, I am handling this particular error and this one. And then all the other ones should probably not happen in this function, such that I have some sort of default behavior. But if you don't have this default behavior, the compiler will complain. Uh, so uh, for, for enum types, uh, it's also very um, uh, it's also very powerful. Like in, in C++ and C, we don't match on type. We don't write programs and we say, oh yeah, if you are of this type, do this. If you are of this type, do that, right? But in Haskell, we, we often did that. Um, in Rust, you often do that as well. Uh, in Golang, you, you typically don't. 
because you don't match on the type of something being passed somewhere ar around. You don't have this kind of uh, uh, algebraic data types and you don't have enums such that in Golang you don't use it, you don't use this structure, but in Haskell and Rust you very often do that and especially with the enum, enum types. So it, it, it might be a little bit foreign uh, for people who are coming from C, C++ type of languages, because in, in, in C++ you don't do that, like you don't have this machinery and you don't do that. But once you get used to it, it is quite powerful and it, it kind of works quite nicely and it simplifies some of the uh, processing or some, some uh, error handling or things like this. So remember that you kind of, uh, every time you need to check something with, uh, you know, tuples, tracks and enums, uh, match is, is good and, if, uh, you know, so um, you have uh, match and you have if let. And then the left hand side is the pattern, the right hand side is the, the variable that you want to destructure or do something with. Of course, Rust has destructuring as well. So of course you can say let um, uh, x, x, y equals v if v is my, um, my tuple, right? You, you can do that. And this is a kind of a non-fading assignment and uh, it will do this destructuring and declare x and y uh, for you, right? Uh, but you cannot do uh, you cannot do failing one, right? Uh, because then it's a bit weird what happens with y and and how that would work. But if you have if let, then you can, right? All right. So um, what else is about matching? Um, Rust doesn't have uh, the function matching. So in in Haskell we could have used all this power of um, matching uh, to define the behavior of a function. Um, so if, if, I have, um, if I have a function fun, which takes a list. Um, so let's say I have a function fun that uh, takes a list and produces a list. Uh, then if, when I'm kind of uh, specifying how it works, um, I can specify, okay, if I get an empty list, do this. Uh, if I get, you know, a list with a single, uh, single element, uh, do this and so on. So we have kind of um, an ability to specify the patterns for the function declarations, right? And in, in Rust, you, you don't have it. So you only have this uh, pattern matching for the logic, but not for the uh, function definitions. Um, also, if you, in, in Rust, if you say, I have a generic function, which takes, you know, anything, uh, then you can match on a particular type. So, you know, if I got an empty list, do this. If I got that empty tuple, do this and so on. So you, you kind of, you know, uh, matching, you know, on a student and, and so on, right? Uh, you can, you can do that. Um, uh, in the function declaration and in Rust, you cannot do that. Um, yeah, any questions? It, it is quite simple. Like, um, um, yeah, that's right. So then is uh, um, uh, pointing out that in Rust, when we say match, um, match and we have something here, and then we have the patterns. So if we have a pattern, then we don't do this notation, we do this notation, right? Uh, yeah, that's a fair point. So that's, that's true. Um, in Haskell, when you have, yeah, the match is called case, uh, you, you do this, and then you uh, do indentation, and then you have a pattern, and then you do this, right? Um, so it depends on the language a little bit and you have to kind of get the syntax right. But uh, yeah, thanks Dennis. So in, in Rust, you use this uh, double, double arrow. Um, they could have, yeah, again, like I, I have no strong opinions, but uh, for consistency, um, the, the match, they introduced a new, new kind of a keyword called match, uh, which is fair enough, but you know, case would have worked as well and cases already existing in other languages for exactly the same purpose. 
So it could have been probably more consistent if they uh, reused the uh, the naming from Haskell. But yeah, that you can't have everything perfect, right? So all right, so that's um, that's the matching. Um, so then we have um, the the final part, which is the the, the second assignment. Um, if um, so I, I need to kind of diverge a little bit because uh, the topic is a little bit bigger than just the assignment. And before I do that, like um, you might be wondering why are we doing it? And the reason why we're doing it is because um, I want you to get familiar with um, different concepts that are useful in programming. So one useful concept, one of the useful concepts that you got used to doing Haskell is lists. Right, so in, in Haskell we have to do a lot with lists, and we kind of did like uh, iterations and recursive functions, and we've used list quite a lot, and that's quite fundamental. So people who came from list and from kind of uh, list like processing, they're quite familiar with it, and it's kind of in the mental toolbox, and it's quite useful. Um, you have a lot of uh, experience dealing with vectors and with uh, kind of a memory allocated data structures and with structs. And that's what you come with from like C++ uh, or C background. And now the final assignment is a little bit about the stack. So how, you know, what fancy things you can do with stack. Um, and stack has a lot of use uses and it is um, internally used quite a lot everywhere in, in, in kind of in programming and in computer science. In particular, uh, Java Virtual Machine is using kind of a, a notion of a stack for, for itself. Um, and in blockchain systems like cryptocurrencies and blockchains, they kind of encode the behavior, the logic of what happens using kind of a stack-based machine. So it, it may feel a little bit esoteric, like it may feel a little bit like, yeah, you know, we don't do things like this, but in fact, we often do, like behind the scenes, we often use stack, right? So the final assignment is about the stack. So let me uh, see, <laughs> scribble on the whiteboard. So, All right, so a stack is a very simple data structure. Uh, we've already discussed stack before, I think. Um, so just a very quick reminder. Um, we basically have kind of a bottom of the stack, and then we put things on onto the stack, right? So if I have kind of a push operation, and I have some sort of value, uh, this value will kind of end up on the stack, right? So if I say push 10, uh, push 20, um, then I will have 10 first and then 20. So uh, kind of a pushing onto the stack kind of grows the stack. And then we have a tip, the top of the stack somewhere. Um, so if I push now uh, Marius, I will have a... Uh, on, on top of the stack, right? So now my top is here. And the idea is that you don't mess up what's under the top element, right? You cannot remove it, you cannot substitute it, you cannot kind of uh, touch it, right? You're only operating on the top of the stack and the stack kind of grows up. So if we, uh, if we have, uh, where is the waiting thing? I've seen it. Oh yeah, good. Right. So if if we um if we kind of uh, put stuff on, so um yeah, let's so instead of saying push, I can just say numbers. So in this particular case, I, I did this, right? So this is my program, and that's what happened with the stack. So now I can say pop, 
and pop just consumes the top element from the stack. So then I will have this on and I have it here. And then I can set, say add. And if I say add, uh, add is an operation. Uh, maybe we can even use plus. Um, and it pops two elements from the stack, adds them together, and puts the result onto the stack, right? So then what will happen is this will be consumed, and then I will end up with 30 on the stack, right? And then I can say pop, uh, or I can say uh, print. And then this number will be printed on the terminal and be consumed. And then the stack is empty. And then if I say pop, my program will crash, right? Because it says, oh yeah, the stack is empty and you're trying to pop something. So I have a panic, right? So this is kind of how the, like you execute the program, you know, from top to bottom or from left to right. I can kind of write it in, in a left to right order. Uh, so if we do that again with the 10, okay, 10, 20 plus, uh, so I have 10, 20 plus, I have kind of a, a, a small program and it's using a postfix notation, right? So normally, like we have three possible options. We can say 10 plus 20, and this is an infix notation. So in infix, the operation is kind of in, in the middle and you have left and right hand side. So this is infix. Or I can say prefix. And in prefix notation, what I do is I say plus 10, 20, right? So I have a function and then I have my arguments. Um, and then in postfix, postfix, I do this, right? I have my operation first and then uh, operands first, and then I have my operation. Um, what are the advantages and disadvantages, okay? So the, the biggest disadvantage of this one is that it can only work with two arguments, right? I mean, we can't really deal with multi pool arguments uh, easily because we don't have multi-dimensional kind of way of splicing things together. Uh, maybe we will some someday, but like we have only left and right hand side. So it can only deal like with uh, potentially one, but it's a bit awkward. It's usually useful for two argument functions, right? If we have binary function, binary function takes two arguments, then infix notation is quite useful because it, it clearly says what happens, right? Uh, so for example, if I say 20 divided by 10, it's quite nice. I, I know exactly what happens, right? So the other two options deal with variable number of arguments and they uh, can handle more than two arguments. So um, let's, let's forget about this one and let's do this one first. So if I say divide 20, 10, it is kind of the same as 20 divided by 10 uh, because this function kind of takes kind of a place here, right? And in normal programming, uh, we sort of are very used to the prefix notation because all our functions look like this. So if I have, you know, a function f uh, in Haskell, I, I put the arguments after. If I have some uh, bracket languages, I do like this, right? Uh, so we are kind of very used to the prefix notation because I have my function and then I have my arguments. I have my function and then I have my arguments. Uh, so if I say sum and I say this, or if I say sum, it, it kind of reads almost exactly the same, just a little bit of a syntactic sugar. And I have my function and I have my arguments, right? And then the, um, the beauty of some of the notation is that I can easily add arguments and I don't change much of a syntax. Here, it's kind of the same. I can add more and it works, right? So again, in, in some programming languages, you have this uh, ability to have a variable number of arguments and then you can kind of an easily express kind of things like this. Uh, in postfix notation, it's the, it's the opposite. Um, so you start with your arguments and then you say what happens. 
then you say the f happens, right? So you say f takes two arguments and the arguments appear, right? So what is the advantage of the postfix versus the prefix? And why are we uh, so used to, um, uh, to prefix, not so much to the postfix? Well, um, there is, uh, that's an ongoing debate a little bit. Uh, one, um, one argument for postfix is that, imagine that I have uh, three functions. So imagine that I have, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, I have an empty F, uh, let's call it, uh, get input, okay? So I have a function get input. It doesn't take, uh, let's use kind of a C like notation. So I have a function get input. It doesn't take any uh, arguments and it read, so let's use a goal and I, I want a return type on the right for, for, for us. And it returns me a string, right? Um, so I have get input, which gives me a string. And then uh, I have convert, which takes a string and returns me an int. Uh, I'm using Rust I32. And then I have uh, a check range, range, which takes, um, uh, it, it, it doesn't take uh, any extra, it, it takes the uh, 32 and returns a bool, right? So I have three functions. The first one gives me a string. The second one um, um, takes the string and turns it into a number. Uh, and then the third one takes the number and turn, turns it into a bool and tells me if the, let's say if the input is valid, right? So we have kind of a sequence. So. In normal, uh, like if, if I have this get input conf and check range functions in Haskell, right? What would happen is you would say uh, check range uh, dot convert dot get input, right? And now I have a function which does all those three things at once, right? It takes one argument. Uh, it actually doesn't take any argument because my initial initial function doesn't take any argument. So this new function, like if I call it f, uh, f um, doesn't take any arguments and it does those three things and you kind of read it right to left, right? Because you have to say, okay, first we get an input. Uh, we don't pass it any arguments. Then this one will produce a string which this one consumes, and then this one will produce a number which this one consumes, and this one will return, uh, you know, so if I call F uh, in Haskell, it will kind of uh, uh, return me some sort of a bool value, and that will work, right? But I'm kind of reading it right to left, right? So now if you rewrite it in Haskell, uh, in, in Rust, uh, if, if you want to have the same kind of uh, behavior, you want kind of uh, the, the same behavior, what would you do is you would say, um, I have a check range, which takes conf, which takes get input, which doesn't take anything, right? So I have one, two brackets, and that, that would be the way you would do it, right? So it's, it's almost the same. Instead of dot, you have the, 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 the uh, round brackets and you say, okay, I'm doing this, this returns me something which ta this takes, this returns something which this takes, and then at the end, I, I get the full value, right? Uh, again, you're reading it like from the inside out and from right to left, right? Um, so this is with the prefix, with the prefix notation, right? Um, so let's see how it would be in the postfix, right? In the postfix notation, uh, the arguments to functions are on the left-hand side, right? So you would write it like this. You would say, get input, 
conf uh, check range. Right? So now this does exactly what this does, but you read it from left to right. And it, it says, okay, do this, then do this, then do this. And then when you do this, uh, the, you know, the result becomes the input for this and the result of this becomes the input for this. So some people say, this is much more intuitive. This is much more natural for us to deal with because it kind of reads like, a, like we read the normal text, right? Uh, you have no, um, you know, um, you, you can see some benefits here, right? Right. So th there are some benefits of doing this uh, compared to this, or even uh, doing that in Haskell. Like it's a little bit cleaner, but it's still the, the order is like you know, it, it's a little bit counterintuitive, right? So this feels a little bit more intuitive, and it feels more like how the data flows through the system. So the postfix notation has some benefits, uh, but uh, you know, so of, of course this is beautiful, this is nice, but like, so then why, you know, almost non programming languages use that? Well, because there is the other side of the coin, right? The other side of the coin is that you do this, right? Um, and that feels really non-intuitive, right? Um, or even worse, you do like, division right and then you you kind of wonder okay shit is it like 10 divided by 20 or is it 20 divided by 10 like oh you know what are we doing here right uh, so for the normal functions the postfix notation doesn't feel that intuitive but for function composition it feels very intuitive right so here you go so you have some advantages and some disadvantages all right the, the debate goes on, uh, and there are some proponents of this concatenative uh, notation, and they say, well, it has, you know, a lot of benefits, and we should use it more, and we should introduce it in some of the programming languages, and then so on. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen. We, we've tried it. We've tried it since, you know, 70s, and it kind of doesn't work, uh, but it has some, some nice properties, right? What does work, though, is the stack-based computational uh, uh, metaphor because it simplifies the instruction set, okay? So if I, if I have a register machine, okay? So I have a uh, register machine and I have AX, BX, CX, DX registers, which have some values. Um, and then I need to uh, do an addition, right? So I want to have a very simple uh, computational model, like a simple, very simple interpreter. And I want to be able to do addition and um, which I will call add and uh, I don't know, multiplication, which I will call, right? Um, so I have effectively two instructions, right? I only have two instructions, but for this register-based machine, when I'm saying add, I have to say, what is the source and where is the destination of my process, right? So for example, I would say, take A, X and B, X and uh, put the result in CX, right? So if I, if I execute this instruction and I have one, two, three, four, if I do this, then, okay, that is a little bit, let's say I have zeros here then uh, what it will do, it will take the two values from here and put the result here, right? And then I can say, okay, then multiply CX with BX and put it into AX. Then I will do this multiplied by this and put the result here, right? So I can do all sorts of different transformations on my um, um, storage or my kind of registers. Uh, but my instructions are quite complicated because I have the, the actual instruction plus I have to encode the three additional operands of where the data comes from and where the data goes to, right? So this is um, a register-based, um, we can kind of call it a virtual machine. Uh, and the instruction set 
kind of is a little bit complex because I have to deal with the operands. What if I want to have negation, right? So I want to say, um, I want to be able to negate a number, but I also have an ability to, um, to, to express subtraction, right? So subtraction takes uh, two arguments and produces a, a result um, in, in somewhere. And negation takes one argument and produces a result, right? So if I say uh, negate uh, AX, then I will say, okay, that becomes minus six, right? If I say negate uh, AX again, that becomes plus six. But if I say subtract AX zero and put it into AX, right? Um, so now I'm, um, yeah, that would, that would make no, no sense. So let's subtract one. Um, so then what will happen is here I not have a register. So I have register here, but I have a constant. I have a literal, right? So I say subtract um, from AX one and put it into a, 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 AX. So I will kind of end up with five, right? Uh, so you can see that this here, uh, this site here becomes quite complex because you have to deal with uh, registers uh, and you have to deal with constants or literals, okay? And you have to be able to encode it. So if I, uh, because you, you will be passing the parameters uh, into those instructions, uh, then you have to encode your instruction set. So for example, I have, um, I have um, four instructions, but my instruction set will be much larger because it depends how I encoded that kind of the middle part. Uh, and depending where do I allow literals and where I allow registers and what I allow at the end. So in some assembly languages, what we do to simplify this, we say, okay, screw that. Let's forget about all this uh, result bullshit. And we will always put result into a AX, right? We choose one register and say, no matter what operations we do, the result always ends up in AX. And then you simplify this because now I only have to express two operands because the, the result is fixed. It always ends up with AX, right? Um, so now if I want to negate you know, BX, I will say, okay, negate BX, but the result ends up here. So it will be kind of minus two because BX was two, right? Um, so you, you can do some tricks. You can kind of try to simplify it, but you know, ultimately the simplest model is you say, uh, let's forget about all of that. Let's use a stack and let's forget all about all of this. And let's always take arguments from the stack and let's put the results on top of the stack. And now my instruction set is truly four because I don't need to deal with all the addressing I don't need to deal with all the complexity of a register-based machine. Uh, I'm using a stack-based machine, stack-based. And I have a stack uh, and all my operations always take arguments from the stack and always put stuff onto the stack, right? So now if I had, I don't remember what the numbers we had there, but uh, let's say we had numbers like this and I said, add. Um, what will happen is uh, the two top elements will be consumed and they will be substituted by, by the add. So if I say add and add, then I will kind of end up with, with this, right? Uh, if I say, okay, now negate, then I will negate the top elements. So I will pop it, pop, pop it from the stack, negate it and put it back, right? Um, so now my computations are like my programs and my instruction set, first, first of all, is much shorter. It's only four instructions. Second of all, they are always the same because I don't specify any argument. So it means uh, they are kind of the same. I can encode it with the same length, right? So knowing how many instructions I have, I can pick how big my representation for my instructions needs to be. So if I have less than 255 instructions, then one byte is enough to encode all my logic, right? Um, 
Whereas with the register-based machines, I probably need to spend some bits on encoding the actual instructions. And then I have to spend bits on encoding the, uh, the sources of the, um, of the movement, right? And then there is one extra thing. So the extra thing is that in the register-based machine, uh, if I had the register-based machine, uh, I had um, I have registers. I have those constants, uh, cons, constants, but I also have memory, right? And by memory, I, I mean I/O in general, right? Uh, so I have to move stuff into registers and move stuff from registers to memory. It, it is kind of the same here. Um, so I do need to have uh, um, an ability to separate um, the kind of the I/O operations from the uh, uh, logic and arithmetic operations, right? So, for example, in uh, register-based machines, uh, let's let's go back to this F thing, right? So, what happens if I have add instruction, and if I say um, I, I can put register register combination? Let's say the uh, results always go to AX. We we have. Uh, a mechanism where results always go way X, right? But I have register with register. I have a constant uh, with constant. I have a constant uh, with register and register with constant, right? So we already have uh, four combinations. Um, what if I add memory here? So what if I say, oh, you know, I want to add uh, a content of a memory location into one of my registers. So I, I want to say add um, uh, BX and here I have some kind of a memory location, right? Um, so then I have to go to memory, fetch the value, uh, add it to BX and put the result into AX, right? Um, and most of the architectures kind of do that. They kind of allow you to write instructions like that because obviously uh, you have to be fetching stuff from uh, from memory to do anything useful. You, you don't have, by default, you don't have everything in the registers. Um, you can do some something slightly different. You can say, okay, uh, like add, um, subtract and multiply and so on. All the uh, arithmetic logic operations don't touch memory. But I have an additional operation like move, which moves a value from register to memory or from memory to a register, right? So I have kind of a spe special operations to do that, right? And uh, it's, it is the same here, but it's, it's kind of more obvious here because um, I don't have registers, I only have the stack. So I can say, uh, first of all, I can make the stack to be the memory, right? So I can kind of, uh, you know, maybe I don't need to be moving stuff to memory and from memory because it already is memory, right? Um, so you can sort of simplify certain things by um, using the notion of the stack and then you can kind of isolate it. Um, it is quite interesting uh, if you think about it. So, so here we have the kind of arithmetic logic unit, which is doing the arithmetic and logic operations for us. And here we have some sort of IO which does the movement of the data from memory uh, into registers. Um, so there are two approaches to that. One approach is that um, kind of a more, more traditional one is that we have um, kind of a complex, um, complex instruction set computers, right? So the machine is quite complex. It has this kind of complex instructions and even sometimes the Allo instructions can operate on memory, right? Um, and then the other approach is uh, RISC, right? So it's a reduced instruction set computers. And in the reduced instruction set computers, they clearly separated uh, what are the operations which touch the IO, which touch the memory, and what are the operations which operate on registers, right? And in, in RISC, this is very well separated and it happens on a kind of a, um, you know, differently, right? So such that uh, those operations are very predictable because they always happen between registers and they can be fixed in terms of how long they take and how they how they kind of operate, right? Um, whereas 
those operations, uh, you know, they, they could be delays, you know, if you're fetching something with, with memory and you already have it in, in cache, L1 cache or L2 cache, that instruction can take different amount of, of uh, um, cycles. So if you're fetching something that you already have in, in cache, you don't need to, you know, uh, actually read it from RAM. But if you don't have it, then you have to read it and then it, it takes longer, right? So they, they, the IO is kind of a little bit unpredictable of how, how things happen, whereas this is predictable. And because this is unpredictable and this is very predictable, you can do this while you're kind of doing that. You can kind of do the same thing and Node.js is doing by doing asynchronous IO, right? So while you're waiting for stuff to come back to you, at that time, you can be doing some other instructions which are not touching IO, but doing stuff on the registers, right? Um, so like ARM is an example of, of a risk architecture and they are kind of uh, doing it kind of slightly differently. And um, it turns out that it is easier to do a very efficient CPUs using kind of the risk architecture because your instruction set uh, is you know reduced and like it's it's um, less complex to do right so you may ask okay so if, if this is clearly better why we were doing that and the reason is that this is clearly better for hardware but then it's a little bit harder to map the higher level programming languages to that particular model so historically we were doing this because it was easier to map you know humans programming computers to this because the way we had our assembly languages and, and, and so on, the, our instruction sets were kind of a more, you know, uh, you know aligned with, with this architecture. But as time moved on, uh, we became much better in doing hardware and even CISC is doing kind of risk internally uh, and they have, you know, uh, uh, the complex instructions being decomposed into very primitive instructions and being kind of organized into a pipeline. And then they kind of do that inside the CPU. They, they take kind of a more complex program and they kind of compile it into this sort of risk-like kind of system, right? Whereas with risk, you do that sort of in software. You don't do it in, on the CPU level. You kind of take all the, all the high level programs and you kind of map it to risk directly by you know, compiler, right? Whereas this kind of happens inside the CPU. So, you can say we have a little bit like a just-in-time compilation happening inside the CPU to translate it into those micro operations, right? Yeah. Anyway, I kind of got uh, sidetracked a little bit. Uh, the idea here is that stack-based virtual machines are simpler uh, because you don't need to deal with all this complexity. Um, so in uh, many cases, they are kind of um, used for specifying the, the computations that are happening. So as I already said, Java virtual machine is a stack-based virtual machine, which uses stack as the main kind of the metaphor for passing arguments to functions. And then all the functions don't have any parameters. I mean, in, in the instruction, because the parameters are being fetched from the, from the stack, right? So, um, that has some implications if we want to push this stack-based um, uh, machine into programming. So we did the initial um, kind of a thing like with uh, 10, 10 plus five multiplied by two, right? So we have kind of an infix notation. Uh, we can turn it into prefix by saying, okay, there is a plus here and there is a, So I have plus for this and I have multiply for this, right? So now it's a prefix, uh, now is an infix, right? If we want to turn it into a uh, uh, postfix, then we say, okay, uh, this goes first, uh, this goes second. So the, the second argument is here. And then I have these two guys. Uh, so I have 10 and five. And then I have to do plus first. And then I have to do multiply second, but I cannot do plus on two, right? Because the plus is done on those two guys. So I either uh, 
So I either do this, right? So now I have plus operating on 10 and five, and then the result of that is, you know, uh, 15 to multiply. So then I have the, the 30, or I have to move this out, right? So I can move it to here, uh, do the plus, and then do the multiplication. And but like with the multiplication, it will work because now I have two and fifteen, and it's still thirty because it's, it's associative. But if I want to maintain the order of parameters, then I have I have it wrong because uh, this is the the second parameter, but it's supposed to be the first. It should supposed to be the left hand side for uh, multiplication, right? So I have to. I have to swap or flip, right? So if I do this, then it will be uh, 15 and two. Make sense? Okay, so that works fine for like simple calculations, but how will that work for uh, more complex things? Um, so, well, it, it kind of depends. So let's take an if statement, right? Um, if we want to write uh, an if statement in the normal postfix notation, we have if statement, then we have a condition, then we have the then code block, and then we have the else, right? So in, um, in, in Haskell, that's exactly how it looks like, right? Uh, the condition is some sort of expression which evaluates to bool, then we have the keyword then, uh, then we have some kind of a code block that is executed if this is true. And then else we have some code block that is executed when it's false, right? Uh, in Rust, well, not surprisingly, it looks exactly the same. The only difference is that if we say if condition, uh, then this first block is just a block. And then to differentiate that block from the next one, we say else, and we have a second block, right? And the reason why we have else um, is that we can, it's optional, right? We don't need to have this at all, right? Um, so because this is optional, we have this keyword. If that was not optional, like for example, in Haskell, that is not optional. Like you have to have an else um, part, right? Uh, and and, and um, in uh, Rust, if you use it as an expression, you also have to have the, uh, the else part, right? If, if that is not optional, you can kind of, don't, you don't need that, that, that one at all, right? Because then you just have a block and a block, right? So you have if condition do this block, if th this condition is true, do this, if this condition is false, do this, right? You, you don't need this extra keyword um, if that is not optional. Uh, and in expression, it isn't, right? So now let's uh, say we want a language that has this in postfix notation, but it's, um, you know, it's a non-optional else clause. Uh, then uh, you just move this to, to the back, right? So you have you kind of end up with condition, uh, true block, false block. And if, right? So if, if we execute this, what happens is this condition goes onto the stack, then this block goes onto the stack, then this block goes onto the stack, and then the if operation happens, if expression happens, and if expression consumes three items, it consumes the else, the then, the condition, and it does it, so it basically eats those three things. Uh, and depending on what the condition is, it executes this or executes this. Make sense? So, you know, it's not a huge difference. It's just that the prefix, prefix notation goes into a postfix notation, right? Um, so uh, a while loop, okay? Uh, we say while condition block. Right? Do this block over and over until the condition, uh, you know, uh, uh, while the condition is true. Well, the same, the same story, right? So, condition 
block while uh, prefix postfix behavior the same um, with this one condition goes on to the stack uh, block goes on to the stack while takes two elements uh, the condition and the, the block and it keeps executing the block until um, until the condition is, is true. So if we write a simple, let's, let's say we want to uh, print hello 10 times, okay? Um, so uh, we have a stack. Um, so how we would do that uh, with the stack? Well, we need to put 10 onto the stack. Uh, we need to put what we want to print. So we want to print hello onto the stack. Um, and then we need to um, do a loop. We, we need to have in, a con con in, in our language some sort of construct of a loop, right? And the simplest one for this particular case is to say, to define a, a, a function called times, which basically does this that many times, right? So now, if this is a kind of a loop construct, we need a code block, uh, and we need to say, okay, so let's let's do that. So we have ten, we have a code block, and we say hello, and then we say print, and then we say times, right? So this is one element on the stack. This is one element on the stack, and this is a function which takes two elements from the stack and does this that many times. Make sense? Um, do you have times uh, in like normal uh, procedural languages? You don't, but you could have, right? Uh, we could have have a for loop that basically says, says, okay, do this that many number of times. And like we often say for, uh, one to 10, do this block, right? So this is kind of like uh, like the times, right? Um, it's just that the, the, the times takes an integer and this one doesn't take a single integer, it takes a range and kind of uh, iterates over, right? Uh, so uh, you could do the same uh, if you want to print that particular, um, um, you could say, I want to print, um, yeah, so if you say print, print, hello, print, right? And if we, instead of 10, we say there is a, a list or range, let's, let's use a range on, to, on top of the stack. And then instead of times, we do map. Um, not, not map. So map takes uh, a list, does whatever needs to be done on each element of the list and returns the list. Right, so we need something like each, which uh, takes this code, applies for each element of the of the of the of the range, and then does nothing else. Like it doesn't put the list back. Right, so there is a difference between map and each because uh, each will take um, and and why we have two prints. So the first print takes the element from the stack, and each takes this range and creates a new kind of stack for this call and puts that, that, that item onto, onto that inner stack, right? So print takes it and does the rest. So if we had, and, and hello puts the new value onto this kind of a inner, inner stack, right? So for each, we have kind of like a, a, a concept of an inner stack that is executed on, on top of this code. Does it make sense? All right. So that's the assignment effectively, right? So the assignment is write a simple interpreter that will be able to interpret programs like this. Um, and you can do that in, um, you can do that in, um, in Haskell, which um, I've done, but you can also do that in, in Rust if you prefer to try uh, other language. Um, and it has, um, I try to make it, as simple as possible, but it is still uh, it, it still requires a number of uh, constructs that we need. So one thing that we uh, that we don't need to do 
Oh, I went over time. So um, please check the um, please check the um, the description. Um, one thing that uh, I really simplified is the the um, parser. We don't want to be dealing with kind of a complex parsing rules such that we just say words and then we get all the tokens kind of in a, in a list, right? Um, such that we have to separate everything with space. So if you want a string, you, you have to say, okay, I, I will have a string, but the second character after the quotes is a, is a space because you want to easily be, you know, you, you want to easily know, okay, I'm starting a string, then I have some sort of string, and then I'm ending the string and you don't want to be dealing with kind of complex parsing rules. So we kind of isolate the tokens by space. Make sense? And the same with the lists. Um, because we do that, we, we don't need commas, right? Because if I, I know I started a list, I know everything that is space separated are the elements of that list, right? Uh, it's a little bit tricky though, like to have a string that ends with a space because um, all those white spaces will become kind of uh, invisible. Like you, you will get kind of a, a string that is composed of all those tokens. Uh, and you have to reintroduce the empty space yourself, right? Such that this approach kind of deals with white space in a bit weird way, right? Uh, but in, for our purposes, that, that will work fine. Um, and then we have a couple of stack operations like uh, duplication, swap, and pop. Uh, we have some simple IO, like printing stuff. Uh, that should be print LN. Uh, so I will fix that. Uh, and reading stuff from the, from the console and like uh, splitting the list, um, splitting the input into this into those tokens. Um, we will have a, a simple numbers and then we will have kind of the, uh, a simple code block. Like that's what, what I discussed here. Um, and there is a if statement, there is a loop, uh, there is a times, and then this each and map are for, um, each and map are for the for the lists, and you don't need uh, all the arithmetic operations. You can uh, probably just um, do the ones that you need for your particular program. Uh, so I gave a couple of like you know doing a fist pass, uh, for example. So um, you know try to do fist pass, try to do factorial, and maybe try to implement the guessing game. Uh, if you know, we don't have random number generator, so the guessing game is a bit dull. I mean, because you have to hard code the, the number into the game, uh, but you can kind of read the answers and do the if statements. So probably for the uh, arithmetic, you, you don't need all of those. Uh, you just check what, what you really need and you, you do that. Um, and then we don't do a road handling either. So if, if the stack is invalid, then we, uh, we just crash. So don't, don't, um, like make the minimum that you need to do to make something, some fun out of it, right? Um, the fun part is the code blocks. So the, the, the values are a little bit um, trivial because we've already, we've already done it in the calculator. Uh, so you can use the calculator for doing that. The fun part becomes when you can apply kind of a, an instruction sequence on top of the, the current stack, right? Uh, that's where, why, when it becomes a little bit more fun. Um, so I like the, it, the specification says kind of a lot of things, but you don't have to implement all of it. You just implement the bare minimum to demonstrate that you, you know, did something, right? If you, if you got the hello world going, that's, you know, uh, okay uh, as a kind of a, the, the bare minimum. Uh, but you, you should be able to deal with the strings and you should be able to deal with the lists and you should be able to do something like, uh, you know, printing element from the top of the stack or something like this, right? Does it make sense? All right. So that, um, it, it works on two levels. So on one level, it works on how you implement this, right? So I sort of suggested that you need to have, uh, you know, the stack, you know, same as with the calculator. But also you need to so, sort of have a dictionary for the things that are kind of defined in the language such that you can look them up and you can evaluate them, right? So you have something like, which is a symbol and the symbols are kind of evaluated to themselves unless they are bound to something else. 
so like for example, if I say Mariusz, um, that is like a variable name that normally, like in normal programming languages, if you say, uh, like in Rust, if you just say Mariusz, that the compiler will say, yeah, I don't know what it is, right? Uh, here we say, um, we just evaluate it to itself such that the symbol, if, if the, your interpreter sees a symbol that it doesn't know about, and you say print it, it will just print that symbol, right? And if you say evaluate it, it will evaluate to itself, like it doesn't evaluate to anything. Uh, but if you bind it to some value, uh, which is a number or a code block, it will kind of evaluate to that thing. And then you can sort of do something with it. So you need to think like in, on the implementation level, how you want to implement it and how you want to deal with this. Uh, so that's the, 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 the virtual machine level kind of thing. Uh, because you are kind of a programmer and you sort of need to, to do this. But at the same time, you are the programmer of this, of the instruction set that you defined here, right? So that's what I'm saying. Like you don't need to implement all the instructions. You just need to implement some of the instructions that allow you to program something useful. Uh, so you're kind of operating on two levels. Uh, and that is, yeah, that is a, a little bit of fun. Um, so we can then compare uh, how different people approach this and how, they, how they've done it. Um, in the next section, next week, uh, we're gonna go a little bit through the, uh, through the tasks that we had so far and through the um, assignment. Uh, so we can gain a little bit more insight of how to do things um, using Haskell. I kind of encourage you to, to use Haskell for this, but I decided that um, if you want to, to master you know, Rust or another language, that might be a better uh, uh, time spent if you choose the language that you want to spend more time with, right? Uh, so I think you all got enough base background for being able to understand concepts in Haskell, but you don't need to, like if you're not planning to be a Haskell programmer, uh, you may instead, you know, decide to do it in Rust. I, I will tell you that if you do it in, in, in Haskell, it will be easier than doing it in, in Rust because of the uh, enum types and because of the way you can evaluate things in, in Haskell. But it, it will not be uh, impossible to do it in other languages. So you can pick another language if you want. Uh, so the, there is no constraint on the language for the assignment. You can uh, do whatever you want. Um, and, uh, and also don't get discouraged that there is a lot of those functions and a lot of things. You only need to implement like, you know, one of out, out of some of the examples to get some behavior going, right? So if you have um, print, you don't need print line because you can kind of, you know, uh, actually program it. You can program print line in print, right? Um, so that's kind of an exercise for you to think what you really need to implement and what you can kind of express in the, in the language that you already have. Um, so some of the loops, like for example, we have uh, quite a lot about the lists uh, and it says, okay, we want each, we want map. Um, so for example, each is the same as map, but you throw out the result, right? You don't need to implement both. If you implement map, it kind of is doing what each is doing. It just doesn't put the result back onto the stack, right? Uh, so that's a simple hint that you don't need all of them. You just need some of them because the other ones are expressed in the in the in, in the uh, in in the other one, right? Same with faults. Um, you can you may need a fault or you don't need to have a fault. Um, there is a like. With the map and each, it's really just implementing the map and throwing the result and having the behavior for each. You don't gain any performance benefits or anything. Uh, with some choices, if you if you decide to code it in the in the language that you already have, it will be slower than if you implement it on the base level because you can cheat. You can do certain things on the base level that you don't have access from the language, right? Uh, so that's why the programming languages like Rust and Golang and, and C++, they do certain optimizations because like as a programmer of Rust, you don't have access to it, but as the, um, as, uh, you know, as the compiler, you do see certain things and you can optimize certain things and um, do certain things that the programmer cannot do, right? So you can kind of cheat. Um, so here is the same, like uh, you can decide to do certain things in the language 
or you can decide to do things on the base level because you have more machinery over there. Um, all right, so if you have any, any issues or any comments, please uh, let me know and then put the into the issue tracker. Um, if something is unclear and there are some bugs, like I already spotted one with the print line, uh, then let me know as well. Uh, and then uh, we will continue with Rust uh, on Thursday. Yep. I, yeah, that's a good question. I don't remember, but uh, let me just check. So I think it's on the top of the page. So assignment two is end of March. And we have, let's see. So we have 9th of March today. Uh, yeah, let me know if you want it to be pushed uh, a bit into the April. I didn't want the assignment two to be too long to eat up your project time because you still need to do a bit of a project work, right? Um, for a group group work. So um, I would rather make the assignment too simpler and make it at the end of the March than kind of push the deadline, all right? So uh, if, you, if you feel it's, uh, if it will be too much work, then we can make it a bit simpler and end up with at the end of March, right? So we have three weeks. Um, so let me see, like, let, let's check after one week how far you got, okay? Um, I think the basics are not too hard. Like doing everything might be, um, might be a bit time consuming, but, um, Doing just the basics uh, should be doable. So we can uh, define like the minimum uh, subset for the for the assignment. So I will try to do that for Thursday. I'll try to kind of define, uh, like I already said, for example, that the tuples are optional. Uh, you don't need to do tuples. Um, So tuples are optional. Uh, we could simplify it uh, with making a um, uh, subset for lists maybe as well. Like if you do string, it's kind of the same, the, the mechanics will be the same as for lists, right? So one of them is just enough to demonstrate that you know how to do it. You basically need to keep track when you're parsing, like uh, on what you're parsing at the moment, right? Uh, same for the code block. So when you start the code block, then you parse it. But if the code block has an if statement and it starts another code block, you kind of two levels deep, right? So if you like, if, if you know how to do that, then you can do that with lists. So string is a little bit simpler because we don't have nested strings, right? We cannot have nested strings. But with lists and with code blocks, we can have nested code blocks. Um, so uh, maybe one of them is enough. So I will kind of simplify the, uh, the spec for the minimum, minimum requirement. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, so sorry, I, I went over time. I didn't uh, see the time. Uh, yeah, sorry guys on, on Zoom as well.